Good evening at Tabernacle Church in Metairie. It's good to have you on tonight. Uh, we're going to be continuing in our discipleship teaching. But before I get into it, I got an announcement to make about tomorrow night's prayer meeting at our new church facility in the parking lot at 7 p.m. We will be out there and we will be having a prayer meeting and some worship. We won't be long, maybe a half an hour, 40 minutes or so. We will have uh, praying. We'll be praying for the facility and for the ministry that's going to be going on there and some other prayers that we need to be praying about. Uh, the, tomorrow night, we probably have some speakers out there. We don't know yet how the setup is going to be. There's also a uh, possibility of us, us having a transmitter that we will be transmitting through your car radio. And uh, when you get there, we just got the transmitter in. We don't know how to work it yet, but uh, we're going to be looking at it. And if we can use it, we'll use it. If not, we'll just put our speakers up in the parking lot. So be there. This is exciting. This is a time we can get together, join together in prayer, especially about the facility that we're working on. We're still trying to get the permit. I'm still working on the permit. And as soon as I get the permit, we're going to really go after it and start working on it. So we will have a place of our own to meet and worship the Lord and, and reach souls for the kingdom of God. So God bless you and uh, hope to see you tomorrow night at seven o'clock. So let's get into our teaching tonight. We're still into uh, the doctrines of the faith. Tonight, we're going to look at the doctrine of the eternal judgment. And we're going to start with verse 20 of, Re I mean, verse 12 of Revelation chapter 20. The apostle John saw this, and he's telling us in verse 12, he says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead was judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So tonight we're going to get an understanding concerning two aspects of the doctrine of eternal life. You know, Christian belief in the afterlife is based on two main ideas, the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment or eternal judgment. The resurrection of the dead we discussed last week. So this week we're going to look at the topic of eternal judgment. The doctrine of eternal judgment includes two primary aspects. One deals with the judgment of those who die in their sins. In other words, unbelievers who have neither uh, uh, searched for God or rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and lived a sinful life. A sinful life is rejecting God and his son, Jesus Christ. So that is one part of the, the doctrine of eternal judgment. The other one deals with the judgment of the believer. We will all stand before God after death and be judged on one or two bases. To those without Christ, they will be judged to eternal, eternal damnation, which awaits those who die without Christ. And then those who die in Christ, we will be judged for eternal reward. And I don't know about you, uh, all my Christian life, I am looking for a reward. People say, well, I don't want to serve Christ for the reward. I do. Why? Because Jesus tells me he has it for me. So I want to live my life to, to glorify God because I know in the end, he has a reward for me, and not just for me, he has it for you. For everyone who lives this life uh, in obedience to Christ and serving Christ for the glory of God will have a reward. So eternal judgment awaits everyone. No one escapes this. There is no excuse. Everyone is going to face God. 
and be judged for the life that they have lived. Believers in Christ look forward to heaven. I've been looking forward to heaven now for 47 years. Why? Because the Bible tells me there's a pure river of water of life that's there. It's clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. In heaven, there's no more death, there's no more sickness, there will be no more tears, no more night, no more seas. This is what Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 says. John said, I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. God is going to renovate the earth and it's, it's going to be a totally different picture. It's going to be an eternal picture. And then in Revelation 21 verse 4, it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So when we look at this, believers look forward to heaven and, uh, uh, and all that God has for us. But however, on the other hand, there is such a thing is called hell or the lake of fire. Just like heaven is going to be the place of blessings for the believer, the unbeliever will face eternal judgment and, and uh, separation from God, which is hell. So we look at two aspects of judgment. One is going to be for eternal reward. The other one is going to be for eternal punishment apart from God. Now, the verb judge has many meanings. When we say we're going to stand before the, for the judge, which is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, it means to judge means to separate. We're going to separate the wicked from the godly. We're going to make a distinction between those who have followed Christ and those who haven't. To exercise judgment upon, that's what the judgment is going to be about. We're going to stand and give an account for the way we live on this earth. We will be brought under question. In other words, we will be judged judiciously because God has already set out his commands. He set out his laws for us to follow. We're gonna be judged according to the word of God. That's why we need to preach the word of God. We need to teach the word of God. We need to obey the word of God because it's going to be the word of God that we're going to be judged by. That's why we need to stay obedient to it. We need to learn it. We need it preached to us. We need it taught to us because in the end, the book is, the Bible is going to be what we're going to be judged by. So it's important to live our Christian life according to God's word. Now in the, the Bible, Eternal judgment is referred to in several different ways. In the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, this is how, what it's called. In verse 5, it says, See, I will send you the prophet Elisha before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. The Old Testament is called the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In other words, it's when the Lord comes back and he judges the world. He judges the earth. He judges mankind according to where they stand with him. In the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment is going to be revealed. You know, the world is deceived in thinking that God is love, which he is, that he's just going to overlook everything. No, he's not. He, he's not only a God of love, but he is a holy God. If he's a holy God, then he's going to have to judge wickedness. It just goes to show you in this world today, all the sin, all the wickedness in the world, there's a separation there. And God is going to judge the difference. He's going to judge his people. He's also going to judge the world. The day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men, the Bible says. Now, when it says men, it means mankind, because there's just as many ungodly women 
living in this world as they are men. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter says, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So Peter is telling us here, there is a day that's going to be set for judgment. It is also known as the great day of wrath of the Lamb and of him who sits on the throne. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, it says, They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now we know who the Lamb is. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. And John goes on to say, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? In other words, when God comes, when the Lord comes to judge the earth, people are going to, people are going to be confounded. They're going to realize their condition and they're going to be crying out that, that the mountains fall. They don't want to see the face of a holy God because when they do, they're going to see their own wickedness that they have been in. So uh, it is known as the great day and wrath of the Lamb of him who sits on the throne. Eternal judgment is certain. It's going to come. Paul is speaking to uh, the Greek philosophers in the book of Acts. He, Paul was uh, preaching the resurrection in uh, Athens, Greece, and some philosophers heard him speaking about the resurrection of the dead. So they asked Paul to come and speak to them in a theater. And Paul told them a lot of things, but I wanna, I wanna read what he says here in Acts 17, verse 30. He's telling these philosophers this about sin. He says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul was speaking about the resurrection, which we talked about uh, last week. So all who are not part of God's kingdom will face judgment. Uh, Revelation 21.8 says this, when you look at the people in the world and all that they're doing and the things we used to do, but we have been forgiven and washed by the blood of the lamb. But we used to be some of these things. But if people die in this condition, the Bible tells us what awaits them. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. See, there's a second death. And that second death is being eternally removed from the presence of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, it tells us it's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a holy God. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 the writer says, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In other words, to be on the wrong side of God is a dreadful thing. If this world only knew what side they stood on, they would come to Christ and repent. In Matthew uh, chapter 18, eternal judgment brings horrible consequences to the unbeliever. And that's when we look at family members, we look at friends who have not received Christ, you got to realize that judgment is hanging over their heads. You know, when Jesus came, he said, the Son of Man didn't come to condemn the world. 
He said, because the world is already condemned. He came to save the world. He came to give himself up that the world might be saved. But those people, that's why we preach the gospel. That's why I gave my life to preach the gospel. We're not going to win everybody, but I want to win as many as I possibly can to keep them from facing this dreadful thing when they have to face a holy God. Those facing eternal judgment are thrown into the eternal fire of hell. Jesus preached more on hell and eternal judgment than he did on heaven. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, look what he says. He says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. He said, it is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. The Lord says, you, you, you're better off as a crippled person and have eternal life than to be a healthy person and enter eternity and go to hell. It's better for you to be crippled now and have eternal life than to have all the things of this world and you wind up in hell. Jesus said, what profit does it does a man gain if he gains everything in the world and in the end he loses his own very soul? What profit would that be? So to be on the, the other side of the cross, and I preach it many times, there's two sides of the cross. There's a blessed side, those who have committed their life and accepted the Lord's sacrifice on the cross have eternal life. On the other side is those who reject the cross, those who reject Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they are eternally in the company of the devil and his fallen angels. When people are sinning in this world, they're, they're fellowshipping with the devil and his fallen angels. But Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talked about the day of judgment where he's gonna separate those to the right of him and those to the left of him. And look what he says here. He said, then he will say to those on the left, those who rejected him, he will say, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So we see that they're gonna face a terrible time at judgment. That's why your own understanding of life or setting your own standards of living, you might end up on the wrong side. We have to come to Jesus, know what his word says, submit ourselves to a holy God and live a holy and righteous life. So when the day comes, which we don't know what day that's going to be when we leave this earth. But when we do, we're going to be on the right side of God. So we see that the, uh, uh, they, they face shame and they face everlasting contempt. You don't want to be on the wrong side of God when you leave this earth. In the book of Daniel, now this is Old Testament speaking about the judgment. He says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, he said, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. He's talking about the resurrection. He said, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. In other words, they go the other way. They go to hell. Some go to heaven, some go to hell. I know some of us were taught in a religion that we grew up in that there's a, another place called purgatory. There's no such thing. Jesus never mentioned that. Jesus says, you're either for me or you're against me. You can't be uh, half-hearted. You can't, you can't be an agnostic saying, well, I don't know. I don't care. No, you can't. There's no middle ground. You're either hot or you're cold. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You're either born again or you're not. That is the difference. So they experience the second death. That is a horrible thing. 
We're going to die once in the flesh. They're going to die twice. They're going to die. They're going to die in the flesh and then they're going to die spiritually, which is the second death being departed from God for eternity. The book of Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 and 15 says this. It says, then death and Hades, which is hell, were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. I remember when I first got saved, we used to sing the old hymns. And one of the, one of the hymns was, there's a new name written down in heaven, and it's mine. See, our names, when you become born again, gets written in the Lamb's book of life. So at judgment day, they will know that you have already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In John uh, chapter 5, verse 22, the scripture speaks of Jesus as being the judge. Now, Jesus is the judge. Imagine this. The judge is the one who came, sacrificed his life to give you eternal life. You reject that, and you have to face the one you rejected as being the judge. In John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but he has entrusted all judgment to the Son. In other words, he said, I'm going to be the one doing the judging. And then in Acts chapter 10, Paul was preaching. He said, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Now, Jesus is the judge. So we just as well submit to the one who's going to judge us. He is the one who paid the price for our sins. So let's just accept him, believe in him. Let's live the life that he commands us to live. So when the day comes that we have to face him, that he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we want. But you know, Jesus is uniquely qualified to judge because Jesus is God in flesh. He is the God man. He is the son of man and he's the son of God. The son of man, he understands man because he's lived this life. He lived this life sinlessly and he suffered. He suffered persecution. He suffered rejection. He suffered like we did. And, uh, as Redeemer, he possesses the right to condemn those who reject him. In other words, he's saying, I paid the price for you, but you rejected me. So that means he has the right as the judge to condemn anyone. In John chapter 8, verse 24, he's telling the religious leaders and everybody listening. He says, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. And that is it. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But if you reject me, you reject the payment that I have made for you, then you're going to die in your sins and you're going to face judgment, which will be eternal. Now, Jesus is the only way. He's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to be saved. There's only one name given under heaven by which men must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. And then in 1 Timothy, it shows us that Jesus is the only mediator between man and God. If you want to go to heaven, there's only one person who is going to mediate for you to get there. In uh in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So there's no other person that you can go to to help you. 
in your sin. That's why we preach Jesus and him alone. There's no other way. There's no other person we can go to or pray to or call out for help. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is our mediator. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. He loves us. He died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's why we preach. That's why we teach. That's why we witness. That's why we try to be an example to a world that's lost and dying. Now, it's an interesting fact here that believers, you and I, who make it, who live this life at, uh, victoriously, that we will play a role in judging the world and the angels. Listen to this. Verse, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, verse 2 and 3. And let me tell you the context of this. Jesus was talking, uh, Paul was talking about believers having disagreements and then taking each other to a civil court. And Jesus said, why you who are believers in the church with godly people want to take your disagreement to a godly judge, ungodly judge, to judge you correctly? And I want to tell you, I had this instance in, in my church. I had a brother in the church in Chalmette who had it was working for another brother in another church. And they had a disagreement on paying on salary, what have you. And they came to me. Well, the brother that was in my church came and said, what should I do, Pastor? Should I sue him? I said, no, you can't sue him. He's a brother in the Lord. Go tell him that the Bible says that he needs to bring your, your, your disputes to the elders of the church and let them decide for you. I told him, I said, listen, go tell him to ask his pastor that if he would come with me and we will both sit down, since we're both godly men with godly wisdom and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we could settle this thing. Well, the brother from the other church said he trusted me. So they came in. I had another elder with me. They presented their case. And God gave us the solution to it. And they both received it. But this is what Paul is telling the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He said, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So Paul said, you can't bring a brother or sister to court. You need to bring them to the church. Now, if one in the dispute who claim to be a Christian will not do that, then you got to treat them as an unbeliever and go to court and let the courts decide. But if both people are believers, you need to come to the house of God where they got elders full of the Holy Spirit that will judge correctly. Now, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Even believers, we are going to stand before God to be judged in the things that we did or didn't do after we became Christian. So we're going to be judged even though we are believers, we're born again, we're saved, and we're living our, our life the best we can. We're going to be judged by what we do. We've got to give an account of those things. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10 to 12, he says, you then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat, which is the judgment seat of Christ. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of you will give an account of himself 
to God. Every one of us at that time when you stand before the Lord in judgment, there will be no pointing fingers at someone else. There will be no excuses. There will be no complaining. We will be standing before God who knows everything about us. We will stand before Christ who is our judge and he will judge us in love and he's going to judge us in righteousness without partiality. His memory is perfect. He knows everything we did everything we said, everything we thought about, everything we looked at, everything we heard, and we're going to have to be honest before God because he's going to know everything about us. We will answer for whatever we did in this body. This means that we will answer for what we had let our eyes look on, what we've heard, places we went, maybe we shouldn't have went, or things we've done that we shouldn't have done, we're going to have to give an account. But guess what? Those who are honest with God and those who live the life that God has called us to live, they will be a reward. There's a reward for living this life, and it's going to be greater than anything you could have gotten here on earth. Those in Christ are going to receive rewards. Uh, and these are the rewards the scripture mentions. They, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says this, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I think the, the, the book of Proverbs says, He who wins souls is wise. He who leads people to righteousness will shine like stars and they will receive their reward from God. Then Paul even talks about the believers receiving a crown that will last forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul said, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. I'm looking for that. I've been striving for that, still am, and I will do it to the end. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, it says this, the Lord says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. I'm looking for that crown. I hope you are too. We're going to get it. and We can just hold on in faith and serve God with all of our heart and all of our might. And there will be a reward at the end. God promises that. I'm trusting in that. I'm believing that because I want it. The Bible says when I get that crown out, I'm going to throw it at Jesus' feet. He is the one who deserves the glory. God bless you. I'm going to be looking for you tomorrow night at 7 in front of our new facility. And uh, we're going to have prayer. And then I'll be back on here uh, Sunday morning at 10. God bless all of you.